Hi, I'm Annie B. Parson, and I'm a choreographer and artistic director of Big Dance Theater. And I'm Mimi Yin, and I teach in the Tisch Art School um, in the ITP program. Um, so Annie B. Annie B. Either. Either. Okay. Um, your uh, the show that you have at uh, Skirball this week is a sort of a three-part compendium of different pieces that you've done at different um, points and um, very different from each other. And I just thought it would be interesting to sort of hear your take on um, what facets of your work um, they're exploring. Oh, yeah. um, well, the first piece is a solo. And it's not, I didn't make it, it's Paul Lazar's piece, and I choreographed it. Mm -hmm. So he's a member of our company, and um, he had an idea that he would make a piece based on Cage's Indeterminacy, which is a hundred um, one-minute lectures, 90 one-minute lectures. He does maybe 15 of them, and while he's saying the, each brief lecture, he's dancing a dance. Um, and I just really liked the piece, and um, so I asked him to do it. Mm -hmm. I also am bringing a duet, which is a premiere, and I'm like really psyched about it. Um, it's a piece that I made that's sort of, I've been thinking about a really long time because even though I don't come from the family tree, tree of ballet, um, I watch ballet my whole life, and it's like, I guess some people watch TV and I watch ballet. Mm -hmm. And um, I was really interested in it. I also studied it for like 15 or 20 years. And I never really thought I was going to be a ballet dancer, but I was always really interested in the forms of ballet. And then I got a opportunity here at NYU to be a fellow at the Center for Ballet Arts. Do you know it? Mm, yes. So it's I like a there research. Last. Oh, you were in there. Spring. So you yeah. know well. Yeah. 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 So, um, although there isn't a like requisite to make something up on the subject of ballet, there's kind of a sense, there's so much ballet around, you know yes. what I mean? Yeah. So I felt sort of inspired to finally make something that actually responds to all of my thoughts about ballet. And what happened was I ended up sort of starting with Agon from 1957, Ballantine's Agon, and it's a piece that I think some people, you know, like go to an art museum and see their favorite painting over many, many years and keep revisiting it. Or like, you know, like even when you read the Bible, there are certain passages that, or lots of passages, that every time you read them, be, depending on where you are in your life, they change. And so for me, that was Agon in a sense. And I would visit it throughout my adult life. I visited it like I was visiting a painting or reading a poem, and it would... Um, my experience of how I felt when I watched it, um, I just always noticed how intense it was. Mm. And so there was two parts of me looking at the piece. One was that I was experiencing the compositional um, virtuosity of George Balanchine in that period that I think was very similar to what Yvonne Rayner was doing and Cunningham was doing of looking at movement material as in a sense non-hierarchical. Mm -hmm. um, but also, I had a different feeling when I watched it in my body. Um, it was like, the, I mean, I think the best way I could describe the feeling was like my heart was bursting. But it wasn't like my heart, like the way you feel when you, you know, you're really moved by like an emotional scene or something. It was more like my, like my art heart. My mm -hmm. art making heart was like breaking. It was so intense for me to watch that piece because the virtuosity of the making of the, the craft like, of, craft it. of mm -hmm. it than the, this moment in this artist's life. Like you could just feel like it just breaking open um, and shifting the form itself. So I really wanted to look at that. And so I ended up making a piece that responds both to what I think is going on compositionally from my own voice and also how I felt. But then what happened was when I started to work on it, I realized that I'm also interested in what he was reacting against. Mm. So that's always really central when you're making work that you're reacting against something. Mm -hmm. 
and sometimes you have to figure out well there's a lot of things that artists reject um, but what are you for mm -hmm. you know what are you embracing so in this case I felt like Balanchine and all the artists of that period that were like I mentioned were rejecting mm -hmm. a certain sort of psychology maybe a Freudian perspective that like everything after Freud really changed psychologically like if you look at Graham's work mm -hmm. the psychological landscape is so intense or Doris Humphrey and a lot of dance work of the first part of the 20th century mm -hmm. and before that um, I think Balanchine's um, own education was based in the 19th century ballet where it was about leaving this earth floating and flying and disappearing and it was a romanticism, you know, of that there's another world that's mm -hmm. better beyond. And so I got really interested in what Balanchine was rejecting and what's underneath what he's rejecting. And so the piece became about that as well. And then I had this idea that I wanted to make the piece also about where ballet was going or where dance was going. And this is going to sound sort of complicated, but maybe like when you make dance do you make dance yes okay so when you make dance and it's not performed anymore mm -hmm. like after the performance mm -hmm. and maybe it's not going to be in any repertory or anything it really is gone and if people went to the New York Performing Arts Library and saw all the videos of my work I would I just feel terrible like I don't think they represent my work at all because there's very it's very hard been said many times it's very hard to capture live yeah. performance mm -hmm. and so that really is disturbing to me on some level and I know some people really love the ephemerality of dance I don't and um, and so to me dance sort of disperses into data in a sense and all the stuff that people are seeing when they look at videotapes of live performance is really just data it's not the experience mm -hmm the kinetic sympathy that you have when you watch live performance. So in this dance that I'm talking about, this duet, I sort of have a section about that too. Hmm. Um, so that's the duet. It's a duet for two women, which is another thing. I always wanted to make a duet about ballet for two women mm -hmm. because you rarely see two women on stage in ballet by themselves. Mm -hmm. You see a man and a woman, it's very like heterogeneous. So that's that piece. And it also plays with Stravinsky. You know, all these things that I was so interested in, now I feel like I can walk away from them a little bit. Then the last piece I made in 2017. And it's from a commission um, for a company of elders in London. Mm -hmm. These were dancers that came from a totally different tradition. They came from the modern dance family tree, which is not mine. Mm -hmm. uh, the Graham, the Taylor, the, you know, and they moved differently. And the, well, the way I was trained was you just do stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very task-based. But the way they were trained is you move through stuff and everything just is very connected and mm -hmm. oily. Um, so I worked with them on a piece, and that was super interesting for me to just sort of realize how different the body is treated. The piece was commissioned in 2016, and Trump had just been elected. I mean, literally, I got the commission like days after Trump was elected, and I was like, as everyone else, completely like blindsided. And I thought, why would I even make anything? You know, that remember that moment mm -hmm. where like nobody w knew what to do? Mm -hmm. You know, why would yeah. we make theater? What would be the point? Mm -hmm. um, well, everything seemed just absurd. And then I thought, well, maybe I should do something absurdist. And I remembered that Ionesco had written this essay about how he really rejected theater and he didn't think people should make it or write it, and it fo he found theater really embarrassing and also useless, and I thought, that sounds pretty good right now. Mm -hmm. And so I decided to work from a text that Ionesco wrote. How does that sort of intersect with the modern dance language and the vocabulary? Well, it doesn't. I was trying to, I was trying to undo that language in those dancers. Okay. 
So they, ha they, what happened? Had, uh, uh, we got like halfway, uh -huh. I think. Yeah. Um, that's what was really cool about getting to do it here was I got to work more on it. In fact, I made the piece, when I made The Road Awaits Us in London, I made it in my room by myself because I only had three weeks for rehearsal in London. Uh -huh. So I knew I had to work on it. I need to bring a draft. So here, I had another three weeks to work on it. So I've had almost more time to finish it here or to do another version of it here than I had originally. Um, the London version, I mean, it was good. It was just like the performers and I weren't quite in the same ballpark yet. We were trying, yeah. you know. And here the cast is, is from the same tradition I'm from anyway. So okay. there's a lot more simpatico aesthetic agreements. Uh -huh. um, yeah. But in both of these pieces, you're working with forms that are not your form that you practice personally. What is that? Uh, meaning like the, you know, ballet, not, like ballet isn't your vo personal vocabulary choreographically. And yeah, but I, I don't, know. yeah, but I'm not like, I don't have a, um, I don't, I mean, there is ballet material in there, but it's my voice. Right. So, but in that, in it's sort of in that collision of working, do you feel like you've, you learn something about the form that you didn't realize before, um, just in, in just even just in examining it that closely. Learn something about ballet. Yeah. Yes. I mean, definitely. something that you've lived with your entire life. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. I mean, yes. The more you play with things and get deep into it, and I had a lot of realizations about ballet, um, and just from you know studying it more deeply and turning my attention to it. Yeah. For sure. Do you, can you? <laughs> do, I know I want to put you on the spot, but well, maybe you can um, share with us. I've said some of them. Yeah. Um, when I've already said most of them, but like also. But do you feel? I guess do you feel closer to it, uh -huh. or further away from it in terms uh -huh. of where your practice is? Um, neither. I feel like it's like I ate the meal. You know, uh -huh. I feel closer to it because I've been working. I've been wrestling with it for the work on this piece. I love it. Mm -hmm. I love ballet. I love it. I, when I say ballet, I mean the form of ballet. I'm not saying the choreographies yeah. of all the various ballet choreographers. Because some of them are interesting. Some of them are not interesting to me. Yeah. But I love the form. I love first position. I love fourth position. Why? Because it's noble. Hmm. It's perfect. I love certain way they use the arms. I love when you take the head away and you do, you know, when you put like, when you mix things up in ballet, mm -hmm. it's so beautiful. Like there's so much to do with it. I reversed it. I put it on the ground. I, you know, you can just play with the forms. The forms themselves are like elegant, perfect, fundamental sounds or harmonies or, you know, I mean, whatever is, you would think of as just has some sort of fundamental truth it has that and when you're you know I've heard you say oftentimes that you um, in terms of your your collaboration um, uh, with Paul Lazar um, that you're you know how to shape a dance and he sort of um, he deals with sort of the dramaturgy of of the theater pieces that you that you collaborate on is that that's inaccurate or um, kind of the well, he didn't do either of these pieces. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, no. But um, in, in sort of your other collaborations, do. sometimes we do. Yeah. So in terms of like when you what what do you mean by um, that you know how to form a form a dance? Is it related to the sort of perfection? Well, that I you're have never about? said I know how to form a dance. Okay. I I mean I would be. I don't, even when you said that, I was like, I hope I have some clue about, <laughs> okay. that's a big statement. Okay. Um, <laughs> I have ideas. How, would, how would you say, you know, what, what do you know how to do that's in relation to dance? That's really interesting. I have a sense of my own craft uh -huh. and craftsmanship yeah. around how to sculpt, manipulate, you know, function with movement material. Yes, yeah. I definitely do. Whether it's like, 
wisdom or knowledge. I have no idea. Okay. It's just I have a way in. Uh-huh. Like, I have a car to drive mm-hmm. on the road. I made it up, you know, um, over a long period of time. I mean, I don't know if it's, like, I can't, I can't like, judge its worth. But I can say that I have a, a way to drive to drive in down the road of making dance for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, it changes all the time, but there's things that I'm interested in compositionally, mm-hmm. and those things I just continue to, you know, massage in a sense to look at, to turn this way, that way, to throw over there, to put close, you know what I mean? Issues of, I mean, all these issues of composition, like proximity and line and shape and space and, you know, poetic forms. I've been working with poetic forms for years. Like, do other people work with poetic forms? I have no idea. But in my ballet, for instance, I have a pantoon. Mm -hmm. A pantoon is like a really beautiful poetic form. And I take movement and I replace the words and I use that form. Something like that. Like, that would be part of the way that I would approach dance making is through formal structures that I find. I've made a dance based on an egg carton, based on the compositional attributes of an egg carton, which I find very postmodern mm-hmm. in its equalities. Um, but also I work with scripts and, you know, um, writing and all those things. I just look at them all, I guess, from a compositional standpoint, formal standpoint. Well, I, I just, I find the whole, the conversation about ballet interesting because ballet has this um, ability to both be incredibly story-based and narrative-based, mm-hmm. as well as to be, you know, when you say that it's noble, like yeah. it's this totally abstract representation yeah. of nobility that's yeah. all form and structure and symmetry yeah. um, and hierarchy, right? Yeah. Um, like it, it matters what's on top and what's on bottom. It matters what's front and what's back. Mm-hmm. In this way that um, postmodernism is kind of in yeah. tension with or re- a rejection of. Yeah. Um, and so it's interesting to hear you. But I, the thing is, is that I'm applying those ideas to ballet, which many people have done. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I don't. I th- when I say what Balanchine rejected, he in Agon he rejects the hierarchies of movement. Right. You know, he wouldn't necessarily complete a pirouette right. with a this and say that's more important than the preparation to the turn. The preparation to the turn, he may do six different ways and never get to the the hierarchical finish. Mm-hmm. So I'm it's already there in this in some of these works of his. I mean, nobody really ever talks about it for some reason. Hmm. But it's very much in the way that he's approaching movement in that in those leotard ballets mm-hmm. um so i always get the sense that like um with a lot of the choreography i feel like it's almost like um you know the the 60s like uh tape i'm like losing my words but you know like when you snip the tape and then you remove the splice sound. splice splice, 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 splice. it's almost like the the movement the ballet vocabulary was spliced right uh-huh. and yeah. so that incomplete that that sense of incompletion or yeah there's something missing but that's what keeps you on your toes because yeah. it's 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 um, subverting your expectation yes. for the, the 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 idiomatic thing that you're expecting. Yeah, um, it's rejecting that uh, result mm-hmm. because there's no narrative arc mm-hmm. in that work. Um, it's rejecting the narrative arc that ballet had both in the movement material, which is abstract in itself, right, and in the st- obviously in the storytelling versions of right. it too. So when you talk about um, using text sort of as structure, um, how, how do you deal with the sort of like semantic meaning of the words, you know, in relation to the movement that you are, you're creating? Um, if I'm replacing the words or if I'm actually using the word, when I'm actually using text on stage, how do I deal with the meaning of the text? When you're replacing the words. Oh, when I'm replacing the words, I'm not dealing with the meaning at all. Okay. I'm dealing with the form that the words are living in. Um, when I'm using the words on stage, the meanings, um, I, I like to think of them as very dimensional. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah. 
like plastic, like that they don't have a specific meaning vis-a-vis uh, storytelling because I'm not interested in storytelling at all. Right. Um, but they have meaning for, um, you know, that they have multiple meanings. Mm-hmm. So like um, if you say, if you put a certain movement on a certain word yeah. with a certain word, you can change the meaning completely. Yeah. Um, and I'm playing with that all the time. Well, that's what's interesting about the cage piece, right? I mean, it's... yes, and that, yeah, yeah, yeah totally. Yeah. And that, yeah, and I think Paul was just when he, because this is really his piece, like mm-hmm. when he created it's his idea. And when he created it, I think he was really playing with um, that tradition of how Texan movement, you know, can be overlaid and then change the, change both of their meanings. I'm really interested in when there's no, when chance doesn't affect the meaning. Hmm. Um, like you don't see a relationship. Yeah. Because we know what it's like when it's like, wow, I can't believe that w- those words were with that text and it just elucidated it, but it was just by chance. Yeah. Um, I'm also really into when it doesn't elucidate it mm-hmm. at all. Mm-hmm. And there doesn't, there nothing, nothing, you know, deepens Mm -hmm. from the text because I think that that um, you know if it doesn't refract or reflect but instead it's like wow that really didn't relate Mm -hmm. Um, that experience seems very real to me Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think that everything has like some sort of you know you like the universe is speaking and it'll you know and all that kind of stuff I do think we need to get more in sync with what the universe is, is, is can do for us as artists, mm-hmm. and that's what Cajun Cunningham were obviously playing with famously, but it's like you know, sixty years ago, yeah, um, and how we work with that now, yeah, you know, feels different. I can't speak for Paul, yeah, because literally all I did for that piece was choreograph twenty minutes of material and teach it to him. The rest of it is his, right. how he handles it. Right. But, I mean, that's the whole point of the piece, right? Is that yes. the material comes from two different sources, sources. that are not in yeah. cahoots with each other. Yes. And, yeah, and they're different sort of every night, what... and you watch it, and um, you see what hits and what doesn't hit. And it's really fun because Paul's quite virtuosic um, in it in handling those two balls. So yeah. people literally are just thrilled by the excitement of watching these two things happen simultaneously because mm-hmm. you can feel it's it's really alive. I mean, the text is hard. The text is incredibly yeah. hard. And yeah. he, because of his particular perspective as an artist, I mean, put it this way, Cage had no problem famously with making the audience suffer. Mm-hmm. None. Mm-hmm. I mean, to a point that you almost feel like, wow, <laughs> where's your empathy? You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like, it's amazing the things he put the audience through mm-hmm. and his response to it. Paul, on the other hand, wants to entertain the audience. Mm. He loved, He's a very warm performer, and he's also a really, really great actor. So when he says the text, he says it in a way that's very different than when you look at, like, I'm trying to think of the name of Yvonne's piece where she has that um, experiment. Um, uh, it's from, from the 60s. I recently saw it. Or, you know, any of the other pieces. It's mm-hmm. not like, here's text. It doesn't mean anything. Yeah. Or it does mean something, but we're not here to elucidate that meaning. It's just words. And here's movement and those two things. That was a, that was a moment in dance history. This is much, much more, is much warmer, and um, he's hilarious and kind of wise, and he really gets underneath what Cage is doing. And when Yvonne right. Rayner saw it, and I was like, I wonder what she's, how her response is going to be. And she was, she said, Cage would love this, mm-hmm. you know, was her response. Um, I mean, I don't know, but I always, I feel like he takes it in a really different direction. But at the same time, he's so rigorous about the way this complexity of movement that's going on underneath and really hitting against the words. Um, I don't even know how he does it, literally. I mean, I can tell you how he does it, rehearsal. Mm -hmm. He's just constantly rehearsing, Mm -hmm. you know. 
Um, so yeah, so I feel like that goes a different way. With my work, you know, has a lot of text. Both of these pieces have a lot of text. Mm -hmm. The ballet piece, um, the text, well, some of the text is talks about La Sylphide mm -hmm. from a really subjective perspective. And while they're dancing to this voiceover about La Sylphide and the way it makes you feel, uh, written by John Haskell, mm -hmm. um, the material that they're dancing, I have shaped to an inch of its life. There is no chance, okay? It's the opposite. I've shaped it to say exactly, to respond exactly to the text as I want it. Um, that is probably influenced by my years of studying that tradition, mm -hmm. but it's not that because um, it's, I'm doing it with intentionality. I'm not using chance, mm -hmm. you know. Well, I think it's, I mean, it's such a fine line because if you read the text by Cage, um, it's not random text. I mean, the text is highly crafted to give you a sense of like random left turns in thought. Um, and I think sometimes, you know, people look at chance based things and it's like, oh, like you just pick random things and throw them together in interesting is interestingness comes out of that but that there's kind of a craft that's different from the craft that you're describing in Balanchine's work to negotiating that ambiguity of like looseness and tightness that might not really be that far removed from like crafting something intentionally and not I don't think know, like, I mean I don't know you might know a lot more yeah. about indeterminacy than I do I don't think he there's any chance in the writing, yeah. I think it's very diaristic, right? And the cha the part that's formal, yeah, is his recording of it, where yeah. he gives himself one minute and he speeds up really fast to fit a minute for the long pieces and slows down and makes pauses for the short pieces. Um, and I think the chance part is later what he does with it, with sound and things like that, right? But I think that the text itself is crafted to be suited to that treatment, hmm. right? Um, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I, you know, for a lot of the work that I'm doing, it's you're, you're trying to, you're trying to create that kind of um, um, experience computationally and computation, com like computationally driven chance has the same sort of paradox where if it's computed, then how could it be totally random? Mm -hmm. um, and so you, you are sort of walking this line always between crafting your randomness to produce like a certain set of possibilities as opposed to like opening up yeah, yeah. All, possibilities. all possibilities and that that process is actually not that far removed from the intentionality that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, um, because, I mean, at least from my understanding of, like, your work, you're not, um, like, you've talked about naturalistic acting mm -hmm. versus sort of, uh, I think one of the examples you gave, and uh, maybe it was, like, with the Walker Center, you had an interview, and you talked about um, Bill Murray, it was which I thought was such a <laughs> great example, where Br Bill Murray, like, is an actor, right? Yeah. He's totally an actor, but he's always Bill Murray. Um, and so... In the same way, when you're crafting something, like there's crafting it to the point where it's very certain what it is you're communicating versus you're crafting it, but there's still openness in interpretation that has some of the magic of like indeterminacy of randomness. Yes. Where, you know, there's like, there's the, the, the audience leaves and they can, they can have a debate about what yeah. they actually saw and yeah. what things actually matched up. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, I remember Richard, hearing Richard Foreman speak once, and he said, if everyone laughs at the same time in my work, I feel I failed. Oh, interesting. Yeah, and it's like, do you want to have, are you creating a thesis where you want to prove a point, and you want everyone to leave and say, oh, I saw this play Doubt, 
and now in the third act we realize what doubt is you know yeah. and that's the progression of the play and everyone leaves having the same experience about what doubt is or do you want the audience to leave the room saying I'm stimulated to think more on this subject you know mm-hmm. and definitely I'm in the second camp of I'm I'm I mean I, I don't have an intention you know as somebody that makes things it's more like I'm interested in perception so I'm having an experience as I'm perceiving something and going into this like rabbit hole or mm-hmm. you know LSD trip or whatever you want to call making things and then I assume that the audience I hope will also have that experience of you know deepening their perception of things like that's what I like when I go to see work I like to be slightly confused and feel well sometimes really confused mm-hmm. and maybe that's not the right word but like um, I like it to be ahead of me uh, the work and when I'm when I can follow what's going on I'm so not interested you know I want to go into somebody's consciousness and be like what the hell is this you know and I I think that that has to do with perceptions hmm. it's interesting because we in our program we deal with both students who are interested in design and students who are interested in art making um, and I feel like that's maybe a really good uh, like boundary to draw to distinguish between the two uh. you know like design you're really trying not to be ahead of your audience yeah. Like you really want them to be with you. You mean um, when you're someone's designer? Yeah. Oh, when you're working for someone. Because I work yeah. for people too all the time, you know, as a person that I'm a choreographer yeah. also for other people. Right, right. And I, I also, you have to keep your weirdness. I mean, yes, you, you're working for someone else's artistic voice. Yeah. But they're bringing you on so right. you can also, like, within the framework of their vision, you mm-hmm. can feel you can bring an aesthetic with you I mean unless you're just like workman like where they're like I need six of these and four of these and I want it to be in the jazz style and bubble I mean I don't know how to work like that Mm -hmm. but on some level I think it's a little bit of both for the designers yeah you know yeah they can't totally lose their um, subjective perspective well there's sometimes you're hiring a designer to execute on the thing that they know how to execute well that you've seen before yeah yeah versus bring on a designer who's going to discover something yeah yeah in the process right, right. of working with right you. right yeah right yeah um when it's something super clear i feel like it's so much easier from a craft perspective because it's a little bit like the tendency to hyperextend, where you when you hyperextend, you it feels good because you know you're like at maximum stretch. You know yeah. you're like really working it. Yeah. And when you know you're being clear, like you have a thesis, like uh-huh. you said, which is a nice way of putting it. Um, you know, you know you did something. Whereas it seems so murky and hard to like negotiate the ambiguity of like it being something, but not being a thing. Right. 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 Because how do you know that it's not nothing? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know anything about my own work. I really don't. I mean, I agree. I don't know if it's not nothing. Do you, I mean, what are the conversations you have with your collaborators, with your performers, to uh, like work through that not knowing process? Um, well, that's my problem, kind of. Uh, I, it's like a, it's like, it's really like a dog on a scent, with a scent on a trail mm-hmm. um, and nobody can get in my mind you know what I mean like nobody can if it, it's really helpful sometimes to talk to people of your collaborators about things that are going on in the room that you're seeing like did that make sense to you or you know some people have great ideas and that's wonderful but it's a pretty lonely business actually mm-hmm. and um, and they're it's the same, you know, because I work on both sides, as I said, like where I'm that person that's the collaborator, mm-hmm. and I know what it's like, because that's really hard, too, because you're trying to figure out what this person wants, mm-hmm. you know, what they're going for, and they don't necessarily know, mm-hmm. you know, so there's a lot of that. But with my collaborators, well, I often have a very, very strong ideas about clothes and very strong idea about music, 
so and I often bring it in um, in ballet I had all the ideas were already there and then I brought in this great designer who just made them so much better but I knew I wanted fronts and back skirts I often work with aprons um, I just made a I have a book coming out where I have a chart of all the aprons not even all the aprons in every piece I've used but many aprons because oh. I think aprons are really incredible in so many ways and I've been having aprons in my work forever do I know like why because they're quick to put on and off because they're very female because they I love the rectangular panel because because I mean there's so many reasons I love aprons um, I also like back putting aprons on the back I like attaching braids to coats I like doing all these you know I don't know why but mm -hmm. I've been doing them for a really long time and developing them and then my collaborators sort of they're not conversations of why do you want an apron yeah but more like oh you want an apron in pink bubble wrap okay really cool <laughs> okay okay so then he makes it into something much more amazing than I could ever do so there's that kind of conversation and then in sound like I knew I wanted to work with Stravinsky for instance with yeah. the ballet piece um, but I didn't want to I knew I also I was, like I'm smart enough to know Stravinsky will also bury me if mm -hmm. I really really use Stravinsky because mm -hmm. I have used Stravinsky my whole life as a choreographer but I have never the audience never hears Stravinsky I would like choreograph to Stravinsky and then erase it mm. um, and but the, all the complexities of the rhythms are there it's a very rigorous process because he's very complicated I had a whole phase where I was like bearing Stravinsky and everything. Who needs to know that? You know what I mean? Mm, yeah. You just see something that's incredibly rhythmic and it may be just to a tone. You know what I mean? Or something. So um, I might say to my, in this case, I said to the, to the sound designer, I really want to work with this period of Stravinsky, but I want you to really mess it up. So you might play two notes of Stravinsky and then extend it and then we may hear those two notes again at some point. Um, or, you know, I really want data in this piece because I'm talking about how ballet is moving into data or dance is moving into that. And so we're playing with data, but then they're making it really great, you know, mm -hmm. because I'm not, I was a sound designer, but I'm not a sound designer anymore. Um, so it's more like I bring in big, big chunks of ideas mm -hmm. and then they develop them and so if I mean it seems like sound and sort of costume are these tangible artifacts yeah that yeah you kind of bring into the process yeah but the movement itself the choreography itself yeah. that happens in studio or both yeah both well it's so different for every piece I make yeah sometimes I don't make any movement and I just make like basically what you would call now like an algorithm. Mm -hmm. We used to call it a dance score. Right. <laughs> <laughs> How language changes. <laughs> um, we also used to say we rehearsed. Now we have a dance practice. Yeah. And now we do research. Right. But it's all the same. Yeah. You know. So um, I would bring it. I bring in forms like a pantoon, for instance. Mm -hmm. And then I took. We would look at the tape of Agon and take like six movements, mm -hmm. depending on how many words were in each line, and then put it into the form. Yeah. So the dancers are incredibly active in yeah. terms of making the material. Other pieces, I actually dance in my room and right. make phrases and come in and teach them, uh -huh. you know? So it just depends. But when, when you work with dancers that are at a very high level of dance making, what they call devising now. Yeah. Um, it is for me the material is so much better if I don't make it. Mm. It's so much better if we. It's like a tennis match where, like, I throw a form at them, they throw it back, I change it, they change it. You know, it goes back and forth and back and forth until we find the movement. That's mm -hmm. the best movement. There are many dancers that are not trained to do that. Right. Like, when I worked in London, those dancers, that's not their training. When I've worked with ballet people, that's not their training. You yeah. don't go into a ballet rehearsal and bring a form in. Yeah. This is not a good idea. Yeah. Not because they're not good at it, it's because they're not trained in it. Yeah. They're trained in something else, you know? <laughs> so my dancers are, you know, they incredibly inventive with creating material, you know? So mm -hmm. it's really 
better to do it that way. Does that answer the question? Yes, it does. Mm -hmm. But I was really struck by, I did manage to find some video <laughs> um, of Man in Case. It was such a great example of, um, you know, it's the, it's the part where it's the overhead camera. I don't know if the oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. overhead camera. Uh -huh. And then it's a duet with him and a woman. Yeah. Um, and you you know like you can see you can see them like this straight on from the front right and you can also imagine what it looks like from above and then you actually see it from above um, in the projection um, and it's it's fairly slow moving um, but it does hit that sweet spot of like clearly being about something it's like meaningful but not it's there's no drama in it it's not acted in any way right um, and it, it seems like there's this, uh, maybe, rec I, I don't know if it would be accurate to say there's a recurring theme of like trying to find material that means something, but you're not quite sure what it means. Um, I don't know. There's well, this is like paradox of, of like. You see something. It's almost like you you lost the words, and you you're trying to say something, but you, you don't you don't know the specific words you need to say. Um, I still don't know what that means. That end of that piece, mm -hmm. because you know that piece was based on a Chekhov story. Mm -hmm. um, we wanted to when we worked with Misha, he we I guess we both wanted to work with Chekhov, and we thought we'd work on a story, mm -hmm. and. Um, the end of that story I don't know what it means I actually don't know what it means I don't know what Chekhov meant I think that's the genius of Chekhov mm -hmm. and um, I think he and maybe Euripides and there's just a very few playwrights that I've worked with that have that depth where it's beyond understanding what it means it's deeper to not know what it means and I thought or to present something that is that prismatic or ambiguous or difficult um, and in that story he it's a it's a I, w I wouldn't call it a love story but it's a story of a man and a woman who fall in love and she's married and has children he's alone and she in the end they decide not to be together and she goes back to her husband of course it's Chekhov so the husband's boring and the woman's fascinating. Mm -hmm. And um, I think he has the best middle-aged women characters of anybody, mm -hmm. my God. And so when they separate, and that's what that, that dance is right before they separate, um, they, she gets on a train. No, no, no. Yeah, he gets on a train and leaves. And she, her family is at the train station and they never see each other again. And that's the last line is, we never saw each other again. Yeah. And we don't know what Chekhov felt about that. If he felt that she, they should have stayed together or he felt that was the right thing to do. I mean, we all know he wasn't, he was no moralist, mm -hmm. but um, it was a tough one. And I thought if I did the play, play, a dance theater version of it, I might get underneath where Chekhov was at because you know like when you work with these materials for a long time sometimes you do start to get a stronger sense than if you just read the story once or whatever I never did I still really don't know where Chekhov how he felt about this ending in a great way mm -hmm. like not in a way like I should know how he felt but in a yeah. way like that's how that's how good that story is. Yeah. Like you cannot get to the bottom of it. Yeah. It's unresolved. Um, it, it is this this next thought is related to that thought, which is, it's in, in 2019. Like, where are you now with the absurdism of theater, and you know why make why make theater? Why make live performance? Um, are you saying it? That I'm asking is absurd? you, like, where you are. You know, after uh, after the election, why do it? Why do it? Yeah, why do it? Um, I still in this I still don't think it makes any sense I think it could be a solace but I'm definitely not in the world of people that think it can change the world or nudge us you know even in the right direction 
in my experience, the people that come to see most theater work, and I'm not talking about mainstream work, yeah. um, they don't come to sort of explore how they view the world. They kind of already feel it's a, you know, speaking to the converted. Yeah. And then I'm also have a piece on Broadway right now. So I'm yeah. seeing the Broadway audience. And if we could just generalize and say people that can spend that much money on tickets, mm -hmm. uh, are they like more conservative or what? I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I don't think that they're there. I don't think that they're working out. I just don't think so. I think they're there to have a good time. And I think they're there to, yeah, to enjoy life. And I don't know. I mean, it's nice to enjoy life and stuff. I think it's a place where we can think about who we are and we can enlarge perceptions, but I, I think it's better to try to get people to register to vote. Mm -hmm. I think it's a better use of our time. I think it matters more if you're speaking of right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think theaters, on the other hand, you look at history, mm -hmm. for instance, and you think about times like World War I and Dadaism, mm -hmm. and you go like, do I wish the Dadaists hadn't created nonsense mm -hmm. in that moment? It's a perfect, it is a perfect response. The urinal, a perfect response mm -hmm. to what was going on in the world. Um, no, I'm so, it's, I'm so grateful <laughs> that they did it. Do I think it changed the world? I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. What do you think? I mean, is I just you know, is it isn't it enough that you are having those thoughts? No, I and don't think it's enough. I think there's too much. The world, it, it's because then nobody would be right having now. those thoughts, right? Mm, I just don't know. Sometimes I think it's better to chop wood and carry water. I mean, I do it because I'm in this groove. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like you get on your bike. And you're just pedaling, you know yeah. what I mean? And I have a piece to make. I have like four more pieces I really want to make. And I know what they are. And I have the opportunities to make them. And I'm incredibly lucky. And I want to make a movie. Um, and as those opportunities come up, I'm not like, I don't want to make those pieces. I want to go get people to vote. Right. To vote. No, of course not. I want to make the pieces. I mean, I'm, you know, have my desires as well. But do I actually think it matters? I don't know. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard. I don't have the big, I don't have the wide shot. I don't know. Maybe it's the wrong question. <laughs> I have no <laughs> idea. It's, it's, a, it's a great question. I mean, yeah. it's an actually, it's an well, I, I think the way question. I think about it is like, you know, do we really want to live in a world where nobody's having those thoughts? I think it's good to, to know that there are a lot of ways to have those thoughts, what you're yeah. calling those thoughts. Yeah. Um, I don't think you have to make art to have those thoughts. I think you could carry water and chop wood and have those thoughts. I think you could have those thoughts, but it's it's the act of art making that forces those thoughts into rigor and questioning and probing, mm -hmm. right? There's only so... And, and you have to be in conversation with other people. I mean, and there's a whole see, other right? side like, of me that goes like wait fuck that of course it's important because there's a whole you know verticality to our existence that we should of course be deepening everything all the time and that is one way to do it chopping wood and carrying water is another way to do it but making work and looking at other people's work I mean I went to a piece the other day and it deepened me mm -hmm. I was blown away by its perception of the world this person's perception of the world. And I'm glad I had that experience. It was really, really um, eye-opening for me. Do I want that to not happen? Of course I don't want that to not happen. <laughs> but, you know. Um, so, yeah, I could I could look at it that way as well. Those yeah. thoughts. Yeah. yeah. I can't decide if it's more elitist to want to save everybody or to decide that if people don't want to be saved, then it's totally enough for you to save yourself. 
Like I can't decide which of those things is more what to you obnoxious <laughs> or safe. I'm not sure I understand safe. Um, meaning in terms of you know like getting out the vote, like things that would actually benefit oh, uh, or uh -huh. save the world or benefit yeah. the world. Once again, right? like, it's a, it's like, like it's it's a it's it's really a yeah. It's a, to me when it's you, a, you start thinking about it too much and right, you just go in circles. Right, right. I mean, in a sense, when I said get out the vote, it's a belief in, again, it's structuralist. Yeah. Because I'm not saying getting people to vote for who I want right, them to vote right, for, right. but more, it's a belief in this structure that we've created, and that's all we have right now is the structure before it's completely dismantled. Yeah. Um, you know, that could we support that structure rather than an artistic structure? Yeah. Yeah. But I just, it's like, What's the point of, what's the point of that structure existing without the other structure existing? Well, I mean, I, I think that's really lovely. Yeah. I can't say I'd say the same thing. <laughs> but, I don't know. I just don't. But know. I don't have like a yeah. I don't have a well thought out position on this. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you ever will. I mean, yeah. I think it's it's something that just it's like a pool of water. Yeah. I try. Um, but I think that part of it is that you really have to have tried and failed to make something meaningful enough times before, um, t to, to decide that that's a really important question. Um, yeah. I don't know. And I like and I think that can happen very early on. It's not necessarily an age thing. It's like it's just how many times you've like banged your head against <laughs> um against a problem. Um Yeah. And then it's also just like how do you actually put a critical lens on your own work to actually really question it without being defeatist and still be hopeful um, because there's a lot of it's very easy to be insecure about your work and put a critical lens through insecurity which then just makes you not want to do anything um, but to to have that objectivity where you can question yourself very honestly but still like maintain the momentum to keep going forward is um, is a hard place to find yeah oh um, I, yeah, I guess I wouldn't have that conversation with students. I'm very, like, <laughs> very, very involved with the making part of the art with students. They can, the trap for people that age, because uh, I teach undergrads, the trap is that they romanticize art making. And it's it can be very detrimental to learning how to do things. So they don't have an artistic voice. I mean, I think uh, over like 25 years of teaching, maybe I met three or four students that actually had an artistic voice at that age. Some of them, you know, are close to finding ways to express, but they're really just, yeah, just they need to just make tons and tons of stuff and to really wrap their mind around the, this craft of making things and find their own craft. So asking them that question, I just, I, I think it would probably be fairly useless because they would probably have this like sort of grandiose belief. Yeah, it's not, a, you can't ask the question because it's, yeah, it's too easy to have a grand response to it. Yeah. It has to come sideways. Yeah. Through questioning what they're, what, the point is of whatever it is that they're doing. I do have it around dance though, dance itself. Mm -hmm. I have a huge faith in dance. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's essential, fundamental, changes the world, um, absolutely is an important part of who we are and without it we'd be sunk. And dancing, I should just use the word like the active part of dancing, not just dance making like people like me and you and that make dance, that's really cool, but also just people dancing. Mm -hmm. And I absolutely think it's as essential as getting people to vote.